I like to think that in the future, we will face the reality that either we have to work with the machines, which we already have doing, we, we are already doing this nowadays, or we have to, you know, we will have to live with the machines because they will be everywhere. Welcome to The Future Of, a podcast by Fresh Consulting, where we discuss and learn about the future of different industries, markets, and technology verticals. Together, we'll chat with leaders and experts in the field and discuss how we can shape the future human experience. I'm your host, Jeff Dance. In today's episode, we have two interviews with experts on autonomous systems. For the first half, we'll hear from Gurdip Paul, Corporate Vice President, Head of Product Incubations at Microsoft. We'll discuss the evolution of autonomous systems, today's expansion, and the future where autonomous systems really help us solve global problems. Uh, for the second half, we'll hear from Steve Yin, Principal Software Engineer at Fresh Consulting. In this interview, we'll talk about the application to our daily lives, some of the ethics, and some insights on simulation and training of autonomous systems. Welcome, Gurdip. It's a, a pleasure to have you with me on the episode focused on the future of autonomous systems. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks for having me on the show. Awesome. Really excited about to talk about this topic and have listened to you, you know, in Microsoft's uh, Executive Briefing Center talk about the future of AI. And I was really blown away about your vision and, you know, continue to find your name. And if I'm just searching for autonomous systems in the future, like you're, you're there, you're, you're there talking to, to other um, leaders on the topic and really grateful to have you here with us. Can you spend a minute um, giving the listeners a bit more about your background? Great, absolutely. Uh, Jeff, I'm a, a long-time Microsoft <laughs> employee. Uh, I joined in 1990, and I'm kind of like the kid who got to go back into the candy store about three times at least. Um, the, the 90s for me was really about uh, working on operating systems. I was part of the Windows NT uh, founding team. Um, you know, we shipped Windows NT 3.1. Um, and then I worked on, uh, you know, the Windows operating systems all the way to Windows XP. And uh, in particular, I was focused mostly on uh, networking areas, but also uh, contribute a little bit towards the core OS as well. And, uh, you know, so after that, I uh, moved on to work on real-time communications and started that business for Microsoft, which today is now Teams, uh, but went through Link and Skype for Business. And, and during that, I also uh, ran Skype after the acquisition of Skype uh, a few years after that. Um, and then uh, my the third chapter, if you will, really has been uh, on AI. Um, and, uh, you know, I got that in two parts. Uh, one was before, uh, you know, deep learning had really sort of happened. And uh, so we were still in the world of machine learning, still data driven, but machine learning. Uh, and then, uh, you know, of course, uh, for the last six years, I've been working on AI pretty much with deep learning as sort of the core engine in in variety of different ways um yeah so that's my the sort of uh, you know background i'm my my specific focus is on is to look at you know emergent technologies emergent ai um and to see how we can create new categories for the company and autonomous systems is one of the categories that we have created and we are doing more and more in now thanks for that background uh yeah, I definitely see Microsoft as a world leader in so many ways, and it's, and it's cool that you've seen so many of so much of that evolution. I mean, it, it, you've been there for the majority of Microsoft's life, right? Um, so to be able to see all that growth and all that evolution, and then to be working on what's what's coming tomorrow, um, it's pretty influential, I think, to be able to shape kind of where the world is going. And I see you as kind of a key uh, key leader in that aspect. Um, I also recognize you're on several boards of kind of other companies that that are working on uh, some of these, you know, things for the future, like you know, quant quantum computing, um, and uh, I think that that's impressive as well because it seems like there's a convergence of so much technology that's coming together to kind of shape the future uh, right now. Um, obviously, a huge deep background in tech. And and uh, you know being a world leader um, with a world leading company in so many of those aspects and and being at the early stages of some of this invention it's it's really um, uh, perceptive to to think about the, the wisdom that you that you have uh, one kind of 
curious question I have is like, what do you do for fun? You've been so deep in tech. Like what, what does your deep do for fun? Yeah, this is the scary part. Like, I, you know, I really enjoy <laughs> what's happening in tech a lot. So I do read a lot. And, you know, and that has been really one of the joys of my, uh, especially last seven, eight years where I've been able to focus on new things and not just run very large businesses and so on. I have, you know, I can time to learn. But outside of that, you know, if it's winter, you know, I'd love to ski, um, you know, I have two dogs, uh, you know, um, and uh, like to do things with my family, travel. So yeah, those kind of things. So now that we have a bit of the formality out of the way um, on the topic, let's talk, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the current landscape, just give people a little bit of like, hey, here's where we're at today. Then I want to kind of jump to the future and then kind of get some of your advice at the end. Um, so if we kind of start with just autonomous systems, it, it's, it's a big term, it's obviously connected to AI. Can you unpack that just for us a little bit, maybe in the context of like how autonomous systems are different than, you know, the systems that the automated systems or software of today? Yeah, absolutely. So autonomous systems um, are really systems that can operate in the real world. Uh, they can deal with all the variations in the real world. They can make decisions. They can plan. Uh, and they can, you know, operate safely, at least to the expectations that we have. And the biggest distinction between autonomous systems and automated systems is that automated systems, you know, are designed to do a specific task when everything is lined up a particular way, they can perform that task very well. For example, you know, if you are in the assembly line of cars, you have a robotic arm and the robotic arm is one task. It has to screw in the door handles when the car comes to that particular stage. And basically the way they do that is with very high precision, they'll have lasers which will you know, go through these two holes which indicate that things are now aligned and then the robotic hand will just go into place with high precision and then very quickly perform its task and it moves on. Now, in that, in that uh, model, you know, it works great, except that it takes a long time to set that system up in place. So if you wanted to, let's say, have three different cars being going through the same assembly line, it is pretty much impossible. And for each car, you'd have to do so much distinct new work. And then if anything goes wrong, like anything, you know, that this thing is not going to work and the whole line sort of stops. So fragile, expensive to set up, and then very expensive to repair and, and get back on, on track. Great. And you'd mentioned this notion about the, the human, you know, you made a connection to humans um, there. And I wanted to double click into that just a little bit. Like how do autonomous systems tie closer to humans and sort of the human brain than, you know, what we just described? Yeah. You know, the thing about autonomous systems is that, you know, we can all agree that they've been sort of under delivering on the expectation and the uh, the fantasy of autonomous systems today. I mean, you look at science fiction and you look at, you know, flying cars and Jetsons and, and you know, frankly, that world is, we're all ready for it. It's just not here yet. And then you ask the question, like, why why is it not here? And, and that's where, you know, I think the world has sort of come to the conclusion that using these classical approaches... Uh, you know, autonomous system is not going to happen. You know, if you write deterministic code, it's not going to happen. Um, you need to now start using new kinds of methods. What better uh, inspiration for these new kind of methods could there be than the human brain? I mean, the human brain is just incredible. I mean, it's just the, you know, we, we are just scratching the surface of how much we understand it. But we are starting to learn a lot more and we are heavily inspired. So for example, like, you know, even before you get into the mechanics of the human brain and understand how neurons wire to each other and how they optimize that path and so on, even you can look at, study the human brain from the outside and say, well, how do you teach children? How do you teach children to do something? Well, it turns out we teach children uh, and they seem to learn tasks pretty quickly and very autonomously, like they don't need to align by a micrometer. You know, they can figure out, you throw the ball three times, the, you know, the kid is throwing not only that ball, fine, you'll probably pick up the next ball with two hands and still be able to throw it. And even though they've never seen a ball picked up by two hands before. So we, our ability to generalize, um, our ability to learn things step by step, 
our ability to really develop this notions, deep notions of common sense of like gravity. And, you know, pretty soon figured out that when you throw anything up, it sort of comes down. And, and, and you know, to be able to learn those concepts. And that is what sort of, you know, we are now tapping into. Yeah, one, one thought I was thinking about related to that was if it's like a child that's learning, you know, it's sort of like, it, and and we've been working on autonomous systems for for a little while. I mean, uh, but in in the course of time, you know, there's been, definitely been an uptick recently. So if that child is advancing, you know, um, and there's an element of like nature versus nurture, you know, like uh, we're, we're actually trying to teach the child, right? There's the concept of machine teaching, machine learning. I was curious, like at what age would you give the autonomous system child? Now, I know there's lots of aspects of autonomous systems, but generally like, you know, are we at like age 12 and it's like, you know, age five? Um, it's sort of an abstract question, but but what would you respond? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I would say it, it's sort of a, a unfair comparison in the sense that this is good since sort of the evolutionary side of the human brain. I mean, the human, the, 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 the human, the child is, um, it, you know, it really comes into the world like primed with, you know, for priors, as we call it in AI. And, you know, it's just, it's like a machine that is optimized to l operate in this real world. And that machine has been sort of, you know, uh, evolving for over such a lot, at least for five, 500 million years is what we understand now since the Cambrian era that it, it's been evolving. So uh, maybe a, a slightly different way to think of it is that if if it started 500 million years ago in in biological forms that don't look anything like humans, and today we are humans with these very evolved brains, like where are we on that journey? Uh, you know, in the in that timeline, and I would say we're starting to see you know more complex organizations. Uh, you know, definitely not where the human brain is, but we're starting to see more complex organizations. For example, you know, like if you if you imagine a neural net as being a literally a sort of cluster of neurons and, you know, sort of performing a set of tasks, um, you know, the human brain at this point has specialized parts of the brain, which, you know, these clusters of neurons, if you will, uh, which actually do many things. So they're able to actually then reason across those different things and bring them to bear. I think we have not gotten to those next layers yet. You know, and that is why one of the big things you'll hear about AI right now is that this notion of common sense, you know, like we have such deep like language models now, but we don't still seem to have a, no a sense of, you know, this notion of common sense uh, so that an un un uh, train a, a new data point that we've never trained on, that it would be able to actually make as much sense as a human who encounters a totally new situation is, is able awesome. to do. So, you know, you're, again, I, I see you as sort of a world leader in autonomous systems. What are you seeing out there right now where things you see things advancing? You know, we were working uh, together with, with your team years ago, and so much has happened uh, since then. Where do you see autonomous systems kind of starting to advance, you know, today? Um, that could be industries or use cases, but we're obviously at the beginning of a journey that you're helping shape. Yeah, you know, the, the big thing uh, I'm starting to see is that through this acceptance that these this AI-based approach is, is really the path out. Like there's there's no other path and everyone has tried the different paths and so on, but there's like, this is the path and everybody needs to sort of line up on that. So we are starting to see the acceptance of that across, you know, whether it be, you know, armed robots and wheeled robots and, you know, winged robots, we're starting to see that. And, and that is, quite you know it's great to see um and then you see people at different stages of adoption of this vision uh of course you know we're saying well we can make much more robust sensors if we put a lot of ai around the sensors and you're starting to see like you know the visual side the vision side and and other kinds of sensors um i think and a few leaders are now starting to go deeper than that and we call it the perception action loop so uh you know, where that entire loop can largely be done inside AI. Uh, and that has not been the case. Even if you look at a lot of the advanced self-driving uh, cars and so on, I mean, they are 
the way they do it is like they're using AI, let's say for uh, you know uh, for the cameras and lidar and and radar, and then they immediately fall back to sort of code and then say, okay, great, if I see this, then I'm going to go do this, and then they go into the actuation logic, which also may may or may not have much AI in it and so on. But if you can take that entire thing end to end and make it happen, I think that is a tremendous opportunity. We're starting to see leaders starting to do that. Now, are they doing it for like the entire vehicle for all the tasks? No, but they're looking at, let's say, you know, you need to land a eVTOL uh, vehicle uh, and, you know, you see the target, which is the landing pad. We can pretty much use bigger height, like 200 feet. You can hit a button and this is going to land by itself. And that entire thing is being done with AI. And because at that point, we've taken that section of that task and we can do it like really, really well. We, and we've you know seen where you not only see success in a lot of the trained use cases, but then uh, because we're using you know methods which, which have a le- level of generalizability, it, even in all kinds of unseen situations where you know partly, partly occluded because of fog or rain or snow, you know this thing sort of will still land. When uh, you know if it's dense fog, the human cannot operate uh, in it, for example. So it's funny to see that. That's a good example. And, I, I, and also with that new technology, you know, taxis we can take to and from work, the amount of technology that we would hope, you know, would m- make that safe. Safety becomes a critical component to that. And that's where, you know, hearing that you guys are using um, autonomous systems um, makes sense. Also, obviously, cars. What what are some other areas that, that uh, you see more near term kind of expanding with autonomous systems? Yeah, you know, we're starting to see um, like a really horizontal uh, adoption and uh, exploration and adoption. So my favorite example is Pepsi. You may have heard about PepsiCo, uh, Cheetos. So, I mean, this one, everybody likes Cheetos or knows about Cheetos and has had orange fingers at some point or the other. And, um, you know, we have been working with PepsiCo uh, to take the entire production of Cheetos and make it anonymous. Now, PepsiCo, I mean, you know, very, very well-run organization. They have tuned and optimized their systems really, really well. But then they're hitting a plateau um, where, you know, whether it be the waste, uh, because they do a lot of quality control, um, uh, you know, if that's an issue, or if they, you know, reliance on sometimes, you know, the experts who are operating those machines are not available. So what happens to productivity? Uh, if there's varying level of expertise between the operators, then you end up with, you know, some will have higher loss, some, uh, you know, and so on. So they've been like, they've, they've hit this sort of, you know, plateau, which, uh, you know, you just couldn't get past. And then come, along comes, you know, autonomous systems and AI. And we've taken that entire process and we're able to control all the different controllables in that entire manufacturing line to create, you know, to deliver at a at a level that, you know, they've not been able to achieve before. In fact, they were so excited about it that their global CEO actually tweeted about it about a year ago uh, and yeah. how they are, and, you know, they're moving globally to using um, um, the, the brains that are built with our autonomous systems chain. So that's, you know, just tells you that there is absolutely no limit in fact, I would go as far as saying that any process or any system that has so many parameters that we've not been able to control them properly is can be done better now with AI and with autonomous systems. Let's jump to the future. Um, so if we imagine, you know, what do autonomous systems look like 20 years from now? What are some of the 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 biggest problems you see autonomous you said hey it could be could apply everywhere but as we think about the world and where we're going there's been a lot of concern recently how do you envision autonomous systems you know solving some of these these big problems I expect that autonomous systems will will run large parts of the world um, you know uh, in the next twenty years uh, con- convinced of that and I think we uh, you know as a you know s- society as a sort of generation. I mean, we've seen COVID and we've seen what a devastation it had on, you know, global production and global supply and uh, and so on. And then, you know, that's sort of one big problem. Uh, the other big problem is, you know, this climate change is sort of creating 
very, very quickly, um, very novel problems for for humanity. And I expect autonomous systems to to really, really play an incredible role. You know, I'll, I'll give you a couple of very tangible examples. You know, we've seen uh, recently the the fires. Uh, in fact, right now in New Mexico, there's these fires going on in, in, in California, and some of the fires, you know, we know were started by uh, by by power lines, and uh, and they were there was some were of course human. So the power lines, like, you know, it's like an intractable task for the power companies to actually inspect power lines across the state of California. Like, it, it just it's just not feasible. If you had drones which could do that for you, not only do that once, they could do that like every month. You could have drones inspecting every inch of power lines. And they could be, you know, that that that's an example of how you could really impact safety. Uh, the other is, you know, firefighting. You know, we believe firefighting is a task that a swarm of autonomous systems can working in a in a collaborative manner can actually really really do well without any you know um, uh, risk to human life and so on so i think that there is a whole it's not just the efficiency of it i think there is a, this the, the kind of the new parameters that you know humans are dealing with uh you know then there's some more you know things that we've known for a while like if you look at in Japan, you know, they have an aging workforce problem, and uh, you know, for them, it is existential. Like they, they have to rely on you know autonomous capability. Otherwise, they cannot keep their offices running. They cannot keep their factories running, and so on. So, I think that you know, I'm, I'm a believer in this sort of this concept that you know, the world, nature creates the problem and the solution. And I think that uh, in some ways, the nature is putting both these things in front of us. You know, hey, the world is changing and it's getting kind of crazy. But you know what? You have, you know, the antidote for that. And 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 I believe autonomous systems is it. Where else do you see, you know, um, autonomous systems kind of solving solving problems? You, you hit on, uh, you know, some of the, the climate change and stuff like that. And you briefly mentioned, you know, some of the supply chain issues we've been having. Um Care, any other kind of core topics come to mind as far as um, the future and, and how you see this impacting the world? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, absolutely supply chain is already, you know, we're starting to see movement on that front. Um, I think, um, you know, robots in particular, you know, back office, back, you know, working the factory floor. And I mean, those things I expect to be to be all there. I think the maybe the, the hardest thing that we will eventually get to is, when you have these autonomous systems literally working around us in homes, in schools, uh, I think that requires just a, a level of polish <laughs> and completeness uh, because, you know, we've seen even the early days of computing, you know, that until you solve those things, you will never be able to penetrate, you know, the in the, the mass, uh, you know, populations, and, and you should not. Uh, so I think that will take a lot of work, and that's where a lot of the human factors come in. Um, and, you know, uh, safety goes to a whole different level. Uh, you know, no one's going to wear a hard hat, right, <laughs> uh, in their homes uh, and, and so on. So I think that, I believe, is, is going to be our uh, the Jetsons moment uh, when, you know, autonomous systems have really penetrated our lives. There's so many applications for uh, bringing in autonomous systems. But as we think about our personal lives, you mentioned this notion of having robots around us. Um, and can, can you speak to that a little bit more about how autonomous systems, you know, will play a role in 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 robots? Absolutely. You know, I think, you know, I, I believe that the areas that we should focus on most are where the biggest need is. And if you take that lens and apply to, you know, consumer uh, scenarios, I think assisted living is a huge place where robots can have a tremendous impact. Um, and in fact, um, you know, one of my, <laughs> the, the, the greatest privileges of my, uh, you know, uh, my work is to work with some incredible people. I, I this there's, there's a, uh, scientist and roboticist uh, called Dr. Katsu Ikiuchi, who, who works with me, uh, who is focused on assistive, assistive living. And it is really amazing because the approach that, you know, he and his team are taking is that it's not that, you know, so you, 
uh, you know, you need a robot, you go buy a robot, robot comes home and robot kind of knows what to do and everything. Because, you know, in some level that is super hard uh, anyway. It's that you can teach this robot so easily end-to-end tasks in your own way, the way you like them. And and now this thing is like a, you know, when you when you get somebody to assist you, you always tell them, like, you know, you've been, hey, I like to do this way. I like to sit this way and, you know, put my table here and put my coffee here because I can reach this easily. And and so, but taking exactly that approach for teaching these kind of systems at all. I think assisted living, I believe, is very, uh, uh, is a real high need scenario. There are some other scenarios like safety in the home and security. And I think those are also super interesting. It's good to hear that. It seems like if, if we can get that right and do that gracefully, that that we're kind of setting a high, like a high bar, and that um, that is the the human nature of that, and how we care for and support our elder, elderly is is uh, there's some virtue there that I think that that uh, will have a waterfall effect. So that's that's awesome. Uh, I just two more questions, and grateful for all the insights uh, so far. Um, one is, uh, just around, you know, again, this concept of technology changing faster than humans, uh, you know, can, and, uh, and we have so many things coming together right now where, you know, we saw it in the last decade, things changed really quickly. Um, and we didn't, we didn't quite realize it. And, and yet it still seems like we're just at the beginning of, of things really coming together and being able to, to make fast change. So. What what advice do you have people that are kind of caught in the middle where they're not, they haven't really been prepared for you know some of the changes of of this technology cha- you know innovation? I do believe that that with autonomous systems, they will be people will there will be a level of reskilling, and people will need to be, will end up focusing on different kinds of tasks. They will focus on more executive tasks. Uh, they will focus on. Um, implications of these kind of systems and solving the new kind of problems that are, you know, like, you know, when the whole bioethics field exploded, when, you know, suddenly, you know, there were test tube uh, life forms of life, or there was, you know, uh, creating uh, uh, replicas, genetic replicas, and so on. And in in the same way, I think with autonomous systems, uh, there is a, there is a new kinds of jobs that are going to emerge. And, um, I think we need to stay open to that. The thing about progress and technology is that it it's got it's on its own journey, uh, and you know we can in some cases we can not adopt something just because it is possible because we decide intentionally not to adopt it. For example, you know this uh, there was there's been cases where <laughs> the surveillance or these databases where every face in the world is there and you can look it up and all that. And we would say, you know, that's maybe not something we accept as society. But the fact it is there, you know, the fact that you can, you know, clone uh, things is there. But are we cloning humans all over the place? No, we've decided we are going to draw on this. So to some extent we can hold things back, but other things we will not be able to hold back or at least hold back for a long period of time, you know, you will not be able to hold back the fact that a business owner who has a factory is going to make some parts of that autonomous. And you can't hold that back. It, the economy and economics and everything is going to drive, you know, some of those factors. So in which case, reskilling and leaning into that and being much more uh, proactive about it as society. You know, I'll leave you with this anecdote on this that, um, you know, after the first industrial revolution, uh, you know, and suddenly these mechanical machines, steam engines, and, you know, hey, the world was going to change. The big factories were set up. But economy actually went sideways for about 40 years. Uh, and that is called the Engels pause. Engel was this uh, philosopher, uh, thinker. In fact, Karl Marx uh, was influenced a lot by him. He he writes about that. That that happened because the the workforce didn't exist. You know, we had a gradient society, and now suddenly they're supposed to work. They show up in machines, and you know the old Charlie Chaplin, uh, you know, image of people screwing. We, we hadn't even reskilled people to do that, and so uh, we can't afford to do that again. We should learn from these past things and apply them to uh, what the next 15, 20 years are going to be, and and the things uh, things are going to change. Thank you for your wisdom and and. Excited for how you continue to shape it. Um, you know, I think 32 years at Microsoft, that's amazing. Um, you know, how are you going to keep shaping the next 32 years? Um, it seems like that's that's the journey taking us into 2050, which, which a lot of people are talking about. And really excited to watch this and think about how we can design and build it um, with intent with people like you that, that care, 
you know, about the technology, but also about the human experience. So yeah. And people like you, Jeff. So thank you. Good to have you on the show. Really appreciate the time and your, your uh, busy schedule. And um, again, grateful. No, great to be here. Great questions. And uh, yeah, exciting future. Steve, uh, grateful to have you here with us uh, as a you know leader in uh, automated sort of in autonomous systems with a deep with a deep history um, in hardware and software and algorithms. Can you give the audience a bit more about your background? Yes, I. It's good to have to be here with you and. Uh, uh, I started from the electrical engineering training uh, all the way up from college to graduate school and get my PhDs in ECE from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, it's a good process in that I got very solid training in the electrical engineering front. And then later on, all my career path has been dealing with the signal processing, acquiring signal, and analyze those signals and use the information and the features we got to control the system to get the job done. It's a closed loop control process with certain autonomous, yeah. As I understand it, you uh, have two PhDs. You've done 20 external publications and you're an inventor of 15 patents. Is that accurate? Uh, only one PhD, but I did have a postdoc experience with Harvard Medical School. <laughs> postdoc, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. It sounds yeah. like you have a, a a deep set of um, experience, just in, in, on the educational side, but then that on the practical side, actually having run yeah. a business and also worked for some you know world leading companies. Um, I learned a little bit about your experience at Philips. Can you can you speak to um, some of your experience there um, with you know? Uh, algorithms and and autonomous systems and kind of how, you know, what what you guys are working on there. Yeah, the the lab, Philips lab, actually is a very good place to do those fancy researches. And uh, we are actually targeting on about like five to 10 years technology train in the lab, trying to think about what's going next, uh, especially for any technologies that's related with the Philips products, the medical products. And uh, in there, I encountered one interesting project that is to use the ultrasound image to guide the high-intensity ultrasound wave to cause the coagulation of the deep blader and uh, inside tissue. Uh, so it's all a minimal invasive surgery type, but it has to be done without human interference. That's considered that was the time in 2005 to 2006. That was a quite uh, bold uh, initiation to start this kind of project. It's sponsored by DARPA. Of course, they are always looking for some wide off the wax things. But uh, the interesting part is that uh, the algorithm really plays a key role in the whole process. You first need to look at the image and uh, from the image, you extract the bleeding site inside tissue, then feed that information to the energy delivery uh, side using the ultrasound phased array to deliver energy into the tissue. Raise the temperature locally, not into other places, and then cause the tissue coagulations. It should be done all autonomous. So we are achieving a certain level of success by delivering a test bed system. It's a proto prototype system that we can stop the bleeding within 90 seconds uh, without harming other tissues. So that's a good, uh, good project to go. And it's the process that we can look forward, think about down the road, what can be improved? What do we need to further make this product, make this prototype to be a viable product for other similar cases? That's great to hear. Now, Fresh, you're um, you're involved in uh, robotics, and uh, we're trying to pave the way um, for you know robots to connect with robots, or robots to connect to humans, and that's going to involve autonomous systems. Can you tell us more about some of the work you're doing and how that uh, um, how that can shape the future? Yeah, that's even a, being a more interesting part. I think this is going to be the version 3.0 of my career here, that uh, we are diving to the scenarios that uh, we are trying to uh, 
lower the deployment cost of the robotic system by not only implementing a robot solution, but also some other data analytical solutions to facilitate the cooperation between the robots and even between the robots and humans. This is a huge undertake. If it's successful, I think it will open another big chapter for everything in the automation space. One of the things you had mentioned was how you build those systems with intent. You know, and I think your experience building in the classroom, you know, building uh, algorithms and, and software for the classroom and thinking about students and the interaction there, I think is really um, applicable to this notion of building autonomous systems with t- intent. One of the things I heard you say was, you know, how do you keep the humans um, part of the loop um, when they need to be? And I'm interested in more of your thoughts around that. Um, like, when, when does it make sense to make something uh, truly autonomous? And at what point do you kind of build in, you know, this sort of human connection and keep humans in the loop? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Actually, if thinking about human in the use cases, uh, first of all, they can be the object to be interacted. And second of all, they can be some type of operator or controller, administrator in the system. So these are two different roles. And for the first type, it's going to be, we are treating that um, engineeringly, we are treating that as a, as a typical object in the environment. We are collecting its status and monitoring its behaviors and trying to understand what it does, uh, what he or she does, not it. But uh, it's a typical engineering solution for that case. But uh, for the human interference as a operator or administrator role, that definitely requires a lot more work. You have to present the data to that operator. The operator needs to use the human wisdom and the business logic to make a decision, then participate into the control part of the whole process. For those that are like newer to this topic, you know, there's a lot of terms that are associated with this with autonomous systems, you know, there's like machine teaching, there's like, you know, simulated environments, there's digital twin, there's like reinforcement learning. Can you walk through some of those terms and kind of explain in sort of plain English, like what some of those mean? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, definitely the digital twins is a buzzword right now. Uh, It's not a very new concept for the engineers because we always use the uh, simulation and any visualization to help us to understand the process. And I think what's even better is that the digital twins would offer us an opportunity to try to simulate some edge cases, which are not be not able to duplicate in the daily usages. That is to test the engineering limits of the system or trying to identify any potential uh, mechanism we can improve the systems. Uh, we often use simulations to do a lot of work in our daily projects. I think uh, that's a great place to have the value for the digital twins technology in all the robotics work, automation work. You cannot do everything from you know uh, the real lab, everything that's going to be very costly and time uh, time consuming. So yeah, that's a good way to use the technology for our work. And talking about the machine learning part, especially the reinforced learning and deep learning and all those technologies, we have seen quite a good adaptation using those technologies for solving our problems. And sometimes they show much better value and the potentials compared with the conventional methodologies. And this is the part where I'm especially interested in because uh, all my previous college trainings are on the conventional methodologies. I still remember that my thesis advisor, Professor Bill O'Brien, he once told us that you should graduate within five years from this school because by the time you graduated, the first year education is going to be outdated. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that's the, that's the case, that uh, everything evolves at a much faster pace nowadays. So we have to be prepared to adapt to that to change. Yeah. This notion of like mapping the real world so that you can simulate it and train it, right? Be- before it goes out into the real world is sort of like a fascinating concept that we're trying to, you know, we're trying to mimic sort of the real world so that we can train in it. 
right? And we can teach it yeah. um, before you go deploy it, right? And so um, tell us more about that. Like, you know, as we think about autonomous systems, how are, how are people using these simulated environments? Yeah, well, simulation definitely helps a lot in that case, especially when we talk about uh, mapping the world. Let's think about that as uh, like a first step when people interact with the world. The first thing we do is to percept what's surrounding us. So as long as we get the information in a digital way, so we would have a, this is the input to our system block. In that system block, then we can apply all kinds of methodologies to develop the algorithms, to test the val uh, validation and the f uh, test the feasibility and validate it. Everything can be done there. I, I, I know one good example is that the Boeing has already transferred all of its design process into the digital pipeline. So that's a great way for a big enterprise to be able to uh, use the technology, use the simulation to speed up their design and lower the cost for the R&D. And in our case, I will say for the perception side, I will use the SLAM as a simple example. SLAM means the simultaneous location and mapping for the surrounding. It's basically using the camera to shoot around your surrounding. And the camera is smart enough to take note of each uh, pose, each uh, orientation of its uh, shooting. Then we, we stitch together all those uh, images. Then we can reconstruct the 3D space information uh, around the camera. This is going to be very essential for any uh, mobile robots or any automation system. You need to know the surrounding. So that's the case. We we are using the technology and the simulation to get the job done. What are you excited about from a from a perception perspective? Because we know sensors are are a big part of the equation. Yeah, yeah. Well, the perception perspective. Uh, there's a huge community working on that. I think the research front. There are a lot of new ideas popping up every day. If you go to those conferences, you will see quite amazing results uh, happening every day, mostly from those young students. But uh, uh, I would say for the implementation side, we have, uh, we have seen a turning point where by the down selection and the screening of all the previous achievements from the research communities, we can pick some useful ones for our implementations. And those can be deployed into the edge devices, which is able to be plugged into a very energy efficient uh, mobile platform, uh, the mobile chases for use in the automation process. And this is a big step because previously when we talk about those models, especially in the computer vision models using deep learning and uh, everything else, you will always feel the cost effectiveness is not that great when you try to use those technologies. They are useful, but they are not very valuable in terms of the implementations. But nowadays we can see with the computing power bo boosting up and with all those uh, very nice and uh, lightweighted algorithm models being available, uh, also the hardware, the, the, the computer camera hardwares are uh, adding together they make the implementation to be feasible. I view that as a product ready stage coming up. Because previously, in the five years ago, we say it's technology ready, but nowadays I see the product ready moment is coming. Then if, if we talk about the next five years, I would say the commercially availability, commercially ready state will be there uh, with our efforts, adding everybody's efforts, yeah. You kind of hinted at the future a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about the future. You know, here we are today. You've been, you know, deep in this space for like the last, you know, probably 30 years, you know, from, from school to kind of your experience, like in, in the world of algorithms and software and hardware. Um, and that's kind of the future of autonomous systems. As we look to the future, you know, like 20 years from now, what do you see, um, what do you see autonomous systems doing? I believe the, autonomous systems will be ubiquitous everywhere. It will be like a everyday normal items for everybody's life, not only in the factory floor, 
but also in some consumer uh, use cases. Uh, think about now, like in China, uh, some companies are deploying those uh, robot taxis on the open road already. In U.S., it's the case that we have a couple of companies doing this too. This is the beginning. I think uh, with all those technologies penetrating to our daily life, and sooner or later, we'll, have, we'll see a lifestyle change for everybody. This is what's happening. Yeah. The thought is that we're building things that are designed for us not to control. Mm -hmm. But we very much still want to control and have intent in autonomous systems. Elaborate a bit more on that. What are your thoughts? Well, I I wouldn't like the word of control per se, because uh, in the end, you cannot control anything. Especially, I don't believe we can control robot in all the aspects uh, as the technology evolves. What we can do is that we can find a way to live in harmony with those devices and the robots. And robots need to respect the human being, and we also need to respect the robot. Because there are also quite a lot of debate, either in the, you know, the science fiction society or in the public space about uh, should we set up some fundamental rules for for the robots like the first of all robots should not hurt should not hurt human being right um the same thinking about that is uh, if people are using the ai or perception computer vision technologies trying to control people's life like in some spaces they use surveillance cameras in a very abusive way trying to probe your privacy or let you behave good. Um, that's not the right way to use the AI. And also in the educational use, some teachers believe that the AI is interfering with the natural process of the education. So that's the fear. And But looking at this inevitable, we have to use those technologies down the road. So how do we reach a common ground among the people especially among the people to reach a mutual understanding on what's the boundary for us to use the technologies. The boundary, the boundary can be changing over time because nowadays we think that's the boundary, but in 10 or 20 years, we may think the boundary can move up or move down. That's all debatable and it should be all negotiable. Yeah. What are some of the bigger problems you see autonomous systems helping with in the future? Uh, the bigger problem so far, I can see, we, we already have that working in the smart, smart factories, and we have the logistic applications. And also down the road, I still see if we plug in the human factors, I would see the lifestyle uh, space would have some uh, opportunities there. Uh, because it's going to be an easy implementation for one small problem. Then, but if you're adding up all those uh, small problems being solved, then finally it's going to be a large scope of the lifestyle change for our daily life. Um, I would say, again, I'm using the Alexa as an example and also the Amazon Go store. I believe businessly they are still not making money by deploying that many stores uh, everywhere. But that's the trend that it's, uh, it's a combination of the supply chain management and the logistics and the shopping experience and everybody's uh, daily lifestyle uh, factors being mixed together in that model. I really hope that model could be successful sooner than later, but uh, we'll have to see, yeah. It's interesting that you bring up Amazon Go because it's, it's an element where you brought together a lot of technology to try to make someone autonomous in their shopping experience where they're not gated yeah. by, you know, there's no friction there for kind of checking out, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, and I think that's a parallel for autonomous systems in general, right? It's like you're, you're, you're gated, gated or impeded or slowed down, um, but really autonomous systems should serve the human experience for having more autonomy and hopefully less monotony, you know, or less yeah. friction. And yeah. I think that's probably when we get it right. Right where it's yeah. like we've enabled, uh, we enabled us to be more autonomous, um, and and we know that you know, 
machines and robots are like, or, or you know, the, the, the technology that, that Amazon's building is an example with Amazon Go. It's like, that's, that's, you know, it's all around that same sort of thread, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is, is autonomy, that being a, a human virtue that, that's important to, to humans. Exactly. Yeah. I think uh, in our previous work, when we deployed those uh, motion uh, quantification technologies into the classrooms for the Chinese students there, and they, they already see that the measurement, the, the quantification of the motion indices and all, everything else is valuable. And it's done without the human notice, and uh, it's quite natural to fit into the loop. So I think thinking down the same pipeline, when we talk about the robots doing the work, if we still have the human being involved in the loop, it should be the same philosophy that will have the perception down in a very natural manner and also will establish the communication between the human and the robots in another, you know, a more efficient and uh, pervasive way to get the job done. As far as uh, where do you see things going wrong uh, with kind of AI and, and autonomous systems? Where, where do you see us kind of making mistakes? Well, somehow we would have higher expectation for the short-term results. So I'm citing Amara's law is that uh, we often, you know, overestimating the short-term effects of those technologies, but we are often also underestimating that the long-term value for those technologies. So any other advice or thoughts on the future as it relates to AI and autonomous systems that, that we haven't discussed so far? Yeah, I think uh, for the future, technology-wise, I think people are working diligently on different kinds of ideas and everything else. Especially we should be prepared for a new kind of a computation uh, workflow. Because nowadays when we are talking about the, either the CPU computing or the GPU computing, we are dealing with the, the data in either the scalar form or the matrix form. We often talk about the tensor computing in the GPU because that would be very efficient to deal with those uh, heavy load of matrix, matrix data because uh, everything being, you know, discretized to the linear algebra space. Um, but down the road, I would say, if we want to achieve much better precision and a much better prediction based on the collected data, we would need to use uh, the time series in a high frame rate analysis. In that sense, we have to think about changing the way we are dealing with the data computation right now. I have seen many progresses being happening right now, such as people are thinking about, just for example, using the, the camera as an example, because everybody is familiar with that kind of technology. I mean, nowadays, all those cameras, they have a shutter, which you are doing a time average uh, projection of the pixel intensity change in a picture, in, in an image. But if you think about it, how about if you can deal with each single pixel in the time series manner? In that way, you can track down the intensity change per each pixel. In that way, you are, you are dividing this problem, the, the time average of the projection to the image into multi-channel data processing problem. In that way, it will enable a lot of other opportunities for the engineering work. And so that would mean a lot of more new algorithm implementations, which could be more uh, computational efficient and less cost in the GPU and uh, the power uh, consumption requirements. Those are all very uh, important, especially for the autonomous systems. You need to think about how you deploy a much efficient and much low cost system to the data usage. That's a, that's an essential part for making this to be a wide accepted technologies down the road, yeah. The newer kind of camera technologies, uh, typically people refer to that as an event camera, so that the event camera would be able to track down the, you know, the intensity change history, time history of each pixel. That's a great start. And I think right now the resolution, the spatial resolution is not that great, but uh, you know, with all the silicon technologies being advanced, 
I believe sooner or later would have uh, very high definition in the space and also very high time definition uh, signals provided to us for further processing. So that's the, I think that's a very interesting and amazing part. We are very much looking forward to that uh, area to come. Yeah. I think as human, human being, we are, we are naturally fitting into the loop of uh, identifying the problem, solving the problem, then identifying new problems to solve new problems again. This is uh, like an endless loop. And uh, right now, everybody uh, is very enthusiastic in this space. I think that's a very good sign to move forward. Yeah. One last question before we close out, and I appreciated all your insights uh, so far, Steve. Um, any advice uh, for those that you know might be thinking about the future and 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 changes that are coming and are coming into kind of a career, um, coming into some career choices? Um, you know, there's a lot changing right now. So, um, any advice for for the young student that's thinking about? Hey, what, what, where should I focus? Um. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a personal choice. But uh, from my experience, I'm, I'm very fortunate so far, actually, to be able to tag along with all the technology trained. And I still enjoy the work. And I sometimes, actually, right now, I'm still doing some coding for some clients' projects. And it's interesting that I, if I use the old tools, I can get the job done, but I like to search for some new tools to help the job. So, so for anybody's career, especially from the young generation, the, my first advice would be follow your heart. Just to stick with what you are interested in instead of what could make you big money in the beginning. I think as long as you build yourself up and establish yourself in your career, especially talking about an, in the engineering side, you become certain expert in one domain, especially even if it's a very narrow domain. And, you know, all the rewards will come back to you. You don't need to worry about the rewards. I mean, rewards could be the money, the cash, or anything else, the prize, anything else. But I think the true pride for me is still that uh, you would have the opportunities to, to dig more, to learn more, in your every day. So that's actually very satisfactory to me. Appreciate that advice and the, the time you've spent with us, Steve, and uh, your uh, experience and leadership. So great to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to participate. And also, I'm glad that uh, we can, you know, trigger more pounding thoughts among the community to let everybody to participate into the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. The Future of Podcast is brought to you by Fresh Consulting. To find out more about how we pair design and technology together to shape the future, visit us at freshconsulting.com. Make sure to search for The Future of an Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any of our future episodes. And on behalf of our team here at Fresh, thank you for listening.